teachers that helped you, people that helped you, like coming, say, going from grade school to high school? Was well, the, the teachers that helped me formally, I think the one that helped me the most was um, a guy named Sigmund Harry. Yep. That was my teacher at Settlement School of Music. Then I the got Settlement School? Settlement School, yep. yeah, that's where I went. Yeah, he was, he, yeah, he's a great teacher. Yeah, he got me on the right track, you know. He, um, and that's when I was, um, I went to him when I was 10. And he, I studied with him until I was around 12 years old. How did you get in with him? Well, settlement. He was teaching at settlement school. Of music. So he took a lot of students then, huh? Because he was yeah. a hell of a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah, he was my teacher. He used to play a blessing trumpet. <clears throat> Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. A blessing super artist. He played great. And I think he had a French blessing too. Yeah, the Mija. Yeah, but he was trying to get me to buy this blessing, and I wanted this man. I saw one day. I never saw it again. Uh, if anyone ever see it, let me know. I saw Martin Committee Deluxe with a trigger. I see the reason why I specify it because you can find a Martin Committee Deluxe that says Deluxe, but it don't have a trigger. Or you can find a Martin Committee with a trigger, and it's supposed to be a Deluxe. But it's not a Deluxe. Well, it is, but it didn't have the Deluxe name on it. Gotcha. I saw this trumpet that was a Martin Committee Deluxe, and it had a trigger on it, and it was the most incredible trumpet that I have ever seen, man, and it was, and I and I was too young to have it. Oh, man. And I asked my father to buy it, and he, I guess he thought, for a kid, you didn't need it, and I never saw that one again. And that's why. I think Connie Condoli's got one. He gone. He I think he can. No? He can. I, I'm too, I'll be jealous. I'll ask him. Yeah, I think he, that's what he played. But I'm not sure about the trigger, the deluxe yeah, with the you trigger. See this I'll, the check, deluxe I'll check it out trigger. for you. Yeah. You have to say deluxe and have a trigger. See, the yeah. drag is, look, everyone's discovering those. You see the ads, people are advertising, wanted Martin Committee. The Japanese are buying them like crazy. Yeah, Pat I know. was telling me, you know, up in yeah. Toronto, man, everyone wants them. Yeah, well, I, I hope I t had a I'll small thing. I'll keep an eye out for you. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out because, you know, I get a lot, do a lot of traveling. Yeah, that's that was the horn, man. That was, Because there may be some legit trumpet heads who don't even know what the horn's worth, you know, just, yeah. you know, let it go. Yeah, that was, ooh, man, that was a beautiful one. But anyway, um... So Sigmund Hearing was the... He was one. Another one that was very instrumental was Langston Fitzgerald. Langston Fitzgerald. Yeah. Okay. Was he in, right in Philly? No, he was in um, Baltimore. He played the Baltimore City. Okay. How'd you connect with him? Went out to do Kelton School of the Arts. You know, he was, he was teaching me. How do you spell that? The, you know, okay, how to spell that? Duke Ellington. But the, oh, the Duke Ellington, I'm sorry. Duke Ellington. I thought you said something else. Duke yeah. Ellington School of the Arts, okay. Yeah. And he was teaching. He was teaching there? Yeah. And um, he was very good. And he was instrumental. And the other, other two people who was probably even more instrumental was Dizzy and Clark Terry. Yeah, two great guys. Two yeah. gentlemen. Yeah, really. I mean, I mean, Clark, I met Clark when I was maybe 12. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all in this period. And I was a little guy. And I had to learn all these solos, all the Lee Morgan solos mm -hmm. and Freddie Hubbard solos and Miles and Clifford solos, Blue Mitchell mm -hmm. too. So, I, and I wasn't cocky, but I, you know, I was like a kid, you know, a kid, you, not, you don't fear anything. So I met Clark and he had played a concert with his big band. Mm -hmm. and I talked to him and I guess he liked the fact that I was young and he set me on his lap. And he taught me about breathing, taught me how to articulate the horn. You know, he taught me about body huffs and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So one day he said, well, let me hear you play. So he heard me play, man, and I played one of my Lee Morgan phrases. He looked at me and said, oh, you can play. <laughs> at least he was saying that. Yeah. I, I, you know. So after that, he, he was like a mentor to me. And Dizzy was the other one who saw me when I was young and probably was intrigued that I was young. And he used to always keep me around whenever he was in town, and he would teach me things about the trumpet, mm -hmm. you know, like the mouthpiece and um, opening up the throat of it, cutting the mouthpiece smaller to make the sound come out faster. Um, told me about the um, vowels of the trumpet, and um, does he always has? He's the, he taught me the Schlossberg study that he warms up with all the time. So does he always was showing me stuff, man, and he always was looking for me. And he taught me about, you know, he asked me about doing these sit-ups because I was boxing at the time. He said, well, you should try these sit-ups. You know, they're good for playing the trumpet. So Dizzy, between Dizzy and Clark, Clark used to tell me things. He said, you know, these are things that your teacher won't teach you. 
or that they didn't teach me that I had to discover, but they, you know, because whatever silliness that has to do with racism mm -hmm. and all that. He said, well, these are things I had to learn. They're, they're legitimate things, but they don't always tell you. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot from those two. Yeah, man. That's a hell of a pair. I was telling you, you know, Byron Clark helped him a lot. Yeah. yeah. A lot. So I got to call him my teacher. It's great. Him and Dizzy. Well, Dizzy, man, he'd share anything with you. And he, he was so, I mean, he's so smart on the horn. I mean, yeah. And uh, now, did you? Did he get? You, did Dizzy ask you to play piano? I mean, did he get on you for playing piano? And do you play piano? I do play piano, yeah. but Dizzy wasn't the one that did, 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 did that. It was a guy named Mickey Bass. Mickey Bass. Mickey Bass, who was teaching also at the Delton School, mm -hmm. and he was the one that told me, he "said Yeah, you got all the phrases down, and you play the instrument okay." He said, "But you know, you got to learn to play the piano. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to play the piano." And he taught me how to voice chords, you know, and, and the style and the advanced harm, harmonic stuff. So Bass was instrumental in that, and then Bass showed me some things that Donald Byrd had showed him from Nadia Boulanger, mm -hmm. you know. So, I, Bass put me to that. But, um, no, Dizzy didn't talk to me about piano until later, mm -hmm. but by then <laughs> I, was, I was playing a little piano. Yeah. But Dizzy really <laughs> talked to me about trumpet stuff all the time, you know. Like I said, Slossberg, mm -hmm. you know, or alternate scales and stuff like that. He'd show me those things. Yeah, because, I mean, I would imagine, you know, if you had kind of ears, if you're copying Lee off the record, you're figuring out what he's doing on the two fives and things like that. Yeah. And then you got to ask yourself, like, I mean, did you get books or did you ask guys, like, now, how do you play on this scale and how do you do on, what do you do on this chords? I mean, well, you know, the interesting thing is what happened was like I've been listening to those records. So Miles was like I said, he was the one for me. Mm -hmm. But Miles after a while became so advanced after I started really learning the trumpet that I, I Miles and Clifford became so advanced that I went to Lee and Freddie Hubbard respectively. For Miles actually, even though a lot of people think that Freddie is coming out of Clifford and he does. He's got a lot of miles in him, so a lot mm -hmm. of the things that Miles was doing, I got from listening to Freddie Hubbard, mm -hmm. actually, or Blue Mitchell, Blue, even. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the things that Clifford did, I got from listening to Lee. Lee was like a simplified Clifford Brown, mm -hmm. and to me, so I listened to those guys, <laughs> and I was able to pick out what they were doing. But before that, I read that jazz was about hum harmony and theory, so. I went and got a theory book, Walter Piston's book, yeah. and all these books, and I studied and I memorized everything about it. I still didn't know how to put it to harmony. Mm -hmm. I mean, to improvise. To, yeah, jazz. Yeah. yeah, so I kept all these books, and I'd buy every kind of jazz theory book and everything, and I'd study what they meant. I learned all these scales that they had. I didn't understand it, but I could play the solos. But one day, it was Blue, and it was a Lee Morgan solo that I was able to play, and then I was able to link what he was doing to the harmony that I had been that I had memorized it, all the time. It, it came together. Yeah, before. yeah, I saw he played this thing, I said, oh, there's that C7 right in there. Yeah. And these are these are passing tones in here, and he's, a, he's starting from um, um, a neighboring tone and coming down this way. Oh. I get it. It must have been quite a revelation. Yeah, it was. And this is all when I was young, too. Yeah. This is all before I was 15. You know, so I, then I was starting to put the mind with the intu with the intuition. And I, it, and then it became a thrill for me to to go through Lee solos and Freddie solos and Blues solos mm -hmm. and Carmel Jones yeah. and all these guys and, and say, you know, get pick it out. And... and, and when I was taking typing lessons, instead of doing my lessons, I'd be writing out these solos, Clifford Donnelly, yeah. and writing the chord changes just based off of what the solos were. So you just do an analysis of the solo and yeah. the chord changes, that's it. Yeah. That's what we used to do, my brothers and I, we were kids, but they had no books when we were growing up. Yeah. You were probably born in what, 60? 60. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the ESP, right? So, uh, uh, well, that's good because that's the way you really learn. If you right. do it for yourself, man, all the books in the world ain't going to show you anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see. Any more equipment and stuff I'm sure I should ask you. So, Martin Committee and run. Uh, oh, well, I'll just like last night, for instance, on Night and Day, you know, my, imp my impression was that 
you know, you had that Lee Fire. I just, yeah. It's the first time I heard you play live, by the way, last okay. night. Yeah. And, uh, man, that was a great opening set. And it reminded me of Miles in the fact that Miles used to love to play standards. And yeah. I remember him saying to me that, uh, you know, I don't play those standards anymore because these young guys don't know how to play those anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and I got that fear, but I, ha I, I heard Lee's fire in your playing last night. Not like Miles, but like Lee's kind of fire, you know. Yeah. And then on the second tune, it's just a general impression, you didn't announce that second tune. Was that an original of yours? Yeah. Okay. And so that brings me to the next question. Like, are you, you're writing a lot now. Yeah. And, you know, what, what brought you to writing? Obviously, it's the next step. But I mean, Well, I've been writing all along, but um, when I was on a, a, another record label, I kind of suppressed it because they took all my publishing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but now I'm on Warner Brothers and I'm able to exploit what I'm doing. Did they let you keep the publishing? Huh? They let you keep your publishing? Yeah. That's, oh, man, that's great. Yeah. Well, I know when Miles went with my Santana, we said, well, we won't get into that, but we know. I know, yeah, I know. You know the story. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that's a draft. I know. So anyway, well, that's good for you, man. I mean, it's going to help you long term down the road. Yeah. You know, nice young band. Uh, uh, so going to the writing, where, where do you see yourself writing-wise as opposed to playing-wise? You obviously love playing more than writing, I imagine. Yeah, I love playing more than writing, but it's, it's, it should be one should help you out. Mm -hmm. The writing helps the playing. Helps the evolution of your music, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I see it. But I, I you know, I, I'd like to be more of an interpreter. You know. Did Did you? Uh, I mean, did when when you first let's say how'd you get to New York? Let's put it that way. Obviously by train from Philly. But I mean, <laughs> uh, what prompted you to like make the move? Like right after school, or did you finish school? Or I went to Philadelphia. I went to New York first time when I was 16. Mm -hmm. The first person I played with was Philly Joe Jones. Mm. And what happened was, me and Eric, the drummer, yeah. we were in Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and like I said, Miles was my hero. His hero was Tony and Art Blakey and Philly Joe Jones. Right. They liked, and he also liked Lenny White and um, and and Jack. Well, you know, they all you know, and Elvin, but so. We were in school and we didn't know how to make a living playing music. We loved it. We were putting all our time into it. But so I asked Bass. I said, Bass, well, when you graduate out of school, what do you do? I mean, what, what do you do next? He said, well, What do you mean, what do you do next? I said, Well, what is Miles? What does he do? Is he, what's his job? Does he, you know? Does he? What? I, I was <laughs> yeah, scared to ask. He said, <clears throat> "I mean, he plays for a living." I said, "He plays for a living." You make money doing this? Yeah. I mean, it, never mind the thing I was buying his records or I was going to see him. Just never. I'm 15 years old. Yeah. And I just. I guess it was. He said, "Yeah." He said. Yeah. He said he makes more money than everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, where, where do you go? How, how do you do this? I mean, how do you get started? And Eric was like, yeah. What, what? He says, well, you got to live in New York. You got to go to New York. And I said, New York? I said, does, does Miles live in New York? <laughs> he said, yeah, he lives in New York. I said, and Eric said, does Tony Williams live in New York? <laughs> and he said, yeah, he lives in New York. He says, well, what about Art Blakey? Does he live in New York? Said, Art Blakey, I see Art Blakey all the time. He comes, he comes, Boo comes to my house. He said, me and Eric looked at each other. We said, we got to go to New York. <laughs> so we organized a trip to um, go to New York for a school trip, a school um, jazz ensemble. And that's when I first went to New York. But I went up there to really hang. And next thing you know, I was playing with Philly Joe Jones at Ali Zali, you know. And I, I played with him. And he put his arm around me and said, this is my protege. <laughs> and that was the beginning of me going up to New York every other weekend and, you know, keeping money. And, you know, because I, I had a little job in Washington playing locally. Mm -hmm. That's why I couldn't conceive that you could make money.